And you guys are brave. Today is like a double whammy Wednesday because first, it's the first Wednesday after daylight savings time. So it's the first Wednesday where like at six o'clock it's dark, which means bedtime. Like, see ya. Church is an hour past bedtime. So like that's first whammy. And then it rained. Double whammy. Rain a lot and dark. And yet, here you are. Here you are. That's serious. So because this is the serious group, we're going to get seriously into the word tonight. How's that sound? Does that sound good to you? All right. So we're in this series called Invest. And we kicked it off this last weekend. And, and we talked about in the investment through invitation. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that tonight. We're going to unpack that thought a little deeper. And we're going to continue to walk into it. And, you know, investment's this interesting thing. And there's kind of, I don't know, it, investment kind of has... There's two examples of investment, if you will, not just in the Bible, but things we're used to. So the first is an investment that a lot of times we think of when we're talking about the financial essence, which is you, you invest a certain amount of money in the front end, and then you wait a period, and then at the end of that, you get the return on that investment, which is what you put in plus whatever that investment grew, Right? And, and so we have that investment. And the Bible gives us an example of that. In fact, it gives us a very uh, natural in, uh, view of that. And it's represented in the concept of sowing and reaping, right? Of seed time and harvest. And you know what's funny is I've actually heard this preached several times. And it's not that it's, it's wrong. I mean, it's not totally correct, but it's not wrong. The heart's not wrong. But they, they take the word seed time and they say, well, see, it's not seed time. It's, it's three things. It's seed time and harvest. And the, and the reason I say it's wrong is that's not actually what the Bible says. It actually says seed time, one thing, sowing, the act of sowing. Because you see, in ancient culture, in, in the time the Bible was written, no one ever had any thoughts other than from the time you sowed the seed, there's time. There was no such thing as an instant harvest. Like you didn't need to, we, we have to add, we have to sometimes give modern society the thing, like we have to emphasize the time. Like, no, there's time. You don't just like put the seed in the ground and then it's there. I don't know if your kids have ever planted anything and then like the next morning they show up at the pot and they're like, I don't see anything. It's not working. It's like, no, give it, give it time. I did, I went to sleep. I woke up, it looks the same. But there's this, there's this seed time, there's a harvest, but the thing in between the two is time, which is why it's not totally wrong when people say, oh, it's seed, time, harvest. Well, there's semantics. But you've got to be careful when it comes to the Bible with semantics, right? And so there's time. And the time is actually the thing that we struggle with in those investments, Right? Most of the time, we don't have a problem with the seed time because the seed time is actually a larger process. The seed time in agriculture represents we have to go out there and we have to prepare the ground first, right? So depending on the crop, they may be plowing and maybe watering. It just depends. But you have to prepare the ground and then you have to sow the ground. Like it's a process. It is work. And most of us actually don't really have a problem with the sowing part because there's a process to it. And, and there's a task to it. And, and there's a way that we do it. And we get out there and there's a certain time you're supposed to do it. And by the same token, we usually don't have trouble with the harvest. Because we like harvest. That's when you get to see the fruit of your labor, right? And, and we like that. And it's more hard work, but it's also a process. It's systematic. We know we have to gather it. We have to take it. We store it. There's this whole process. It's not just picking something and eating it. There's a whole storage process. There's a process to the harvest. But there's this thing in the middle that is not the fun part, which is the time. Because there's nothing you can do to make it really grow faster, especially not on the, the large-scale agricultural scene. I mean, there's maybe you could put some miracle grow on your single pot at home, but like in a large scale, the, there's, there's not so much thing. Like you just have to wait. You, you can't rush the harvest. If you harvest it too early, it, it's not ready. If you start digging around to see if anything's working under there, you kill it. Like you have to wait. 
And you know, it's interesting because I, I listened to a, a podcast talking about work and work ethic. And you know, a lot of us feel like, man, it would have been so hard to live back then. To live back in like something that was like an agricultural society where you had to go out there and, and work. And here's, here's some interesting facts. They did some, some studies and they did some works and they did up some averages. So the average person like, uh, like us, us now, we work, the average work week, you know, if you look at 52 weeks a year, 40 hours a week, which I know a lot of you work a lot more than that, but that's just the average. That's like a full time, like, you know, whatever. If you look at that, 52 weeks, 40 hours, that's 2,080 hours of work. Okay, a, a year, right? That's how much you work, 2,080 hours. Now, that doesn't count the fact that's your job. Now, usually you didn't have your job and then you go home and you work more because you still have to go work, right? You go work, you gotta cook, you gotta clean, you gotta do the kids' homework. I mean, they're doing their homework, of course. Parents are never doing their kids' homework. That's not how it works. So you do even more than that, but 2,080 hours. And what they found was in these agricultural societies, although during seed time, they worked very hard. And during harvest time, they worked very hard. They didn't really do a lot of work in the waiting. In fact, the average was, they said it was between 15 and 1600 hours is how much they would work in a year. So less than you and I. Now the exception to that would be Chinese rice farmers. Because a rice crop, you can actually get in two or maybe three harvests in a season. And once the season's over, it spends the rest of the year getting their rice beds ready. So they ended up working closer to 4,000 hours. You didn't want to be a rice farmer. That's why they have proverbs in their, in their, in their culture that says, like, any man who wakes up before dawn 360, years, or 360 days a year will be taken care of. I should hope so. 360 days before dawn? No thanks. That's rough. But, but the agricultural society understood the process of there's work and there's reward, but in between, there's waiting. There's inactivity. And I think for us, in our society, that's maybe the hardest part of that style of investment. We don't mind the sowing. We don't mind the reaping. We really hate the waiting. Because in the waiting, you just start questioning. Is it working? Is it growing? Is it going to happen? Is it ever going to get here? Will I ever see the return on that investment? Will the harvest ever come? Maybe I did it wrong. Maybe I should dig up a few to see if they're actually happening. We, we don't like the waiting. And sometimes maybe in trying to help it, trying to accelerate it, we actually delay it even further. We delay it. And that sometimes happens in our investment. And that's one kind of investment. There's another kind of investment that we see, and maybe the best thing or a good analogy for this in the natural would be uh, some sports analogies, which as opposed to a one-time investment, we wait a while and then we see the result. It's like the investment of consistency. You, you see that in sports people. I was hanging out with ORU's track team today. I get to go out there and hang out a couple times. And, and in so many sports, especially like Olympic sports, but really in any sports, you have this process of you consistently work, you daily work, you daily invest, you daily train, you daily sacrifice, Days turns into weeks, and weeks turn into months, and you continually do it, and you continually do it, and you continually do it, all for the one opportunity to see the result of all that investment in a race, or maybe in an Olympic event. Like the Olympics is kind of the epitome of this, because you hear about these people who train for whole lifetimes, wait for four years, so they can get to this one moment, and it lasts like 10 seconds. But the, the reward is how they performed in those 10 seconds, right? Like, but it's this consistent, daily, year, monthly, yearly investment, all for the preparation, all for the investing for this one specific time so that they're ready, so that they're ready for when this championship or when this track meet or when this Olympic, like we, we see that in sports, when they're ready for the opportunity, and there's biblical perspective to this as well. That's why the Bible implores us and Jesus told us 
that we need to constantly be washing ourselves with the word, that we need to constantly be spending time in his presence, that we need to be daily making the investment of time with him. Not to gain favor, not to gain, but because we need to be preparing ourselves and be at a place of preparedness for when something, for when that event happens. And you say, what's that event? Well, the event is the thing that you actually didn't prepare for. The event was the thing that you didn't see coming. In our life and what we walk through as Christians, we're walking through life and everyone goes through where life is good and then all of a sudden something comes up, a trial comes up that you weren't expecting. A loved one's in the hospital. A a financial challenge comes up out of nowhere. A relationship issue, sickness. Something happens with one of your kids. There's these things that happen that we're not ready. And the thing is, all of a sudden you're faced with what ends up being a challenge a test, uh, an opportunity. And you're, you, you, you wind up in this place where you're either ready for it or not. You, you either have yourself built up in a place where you've been investing and spending times so that when the enemy throws the fiery darts, they're either quenched by the shield or they're not. It, it comes to this investment. It comes to the fact that we get to invest this time, that it's, it's a preparedness, it's a daily thing, it's something that we get to continually do so that when the opportunity arises and faith is tested, you, you've invested and you're there. And this isn't a legalistic thing. I'm not telling you that you should spend daily time and prayer in the word legalistically. In fact, the exact opposite. I shouldn't, you shouldn't do it religiously. You shouldn't do it ritualistically. You should do it because that is what prepares you for the moment when you need it the most. The reason that athletes are training, the reason that athletes are preparing is so when the moment arises, they can perform at their peak potential. The reason that we spend time in God's presence and we encourage our faith and we build ourselves up is that when that thing happens, when that thing comes against us, we're not all of a sudden scrambling and trying to bring things together and figure it out. We have stored enough and we are ready and we have invested enough that when the opportunity comes, we are able to walk in the boldness that God has for us. I think about Jesus whenever he went into the wilderness And he spent 40 days in the wilderness. And at the end of 40 days in the wilderness, when he was tired, when he was hungry, he was maybe even a little bit hangry, the enemy comes at that time. And the enemy at that time tempts Jesus. At his weakest point, at his lowest point, at his tired point. When things weren't great, he wasn't on a high. He wasn't just at the best. This wasn't after the wedding ceremony. Satan could have attacked him after he turned water into wine. But Jesus was full then. Jesus was rested then. He waited till Jesus wasn't at a good place. And he thought maybe this is the first time Jesus has gone a long time without this. And now he's got this thing called a human body. Maybe this will be my ticket in. Maybe he'll, this physical strain will be the opening I need to make the Son of God fall. And if I can get the Son of God to fall, then I can doom all mankind. And so he goes and he tempts Jesus. And how does Jesus respond to the three temptations? With the word. It is written, it is written, it is written. And you know what? It wasn't that week that he was in the word. How do I know? Because when he was 12 years old, he was in his father's house in the word, teaching the word. He was giving the word. He was always in the word. He knew the word. At 12 years old, he went and taught at a synagogue, and they were like, uh, who is this guy? It's like he knows it better than we do. And yeah, he did know it better than them. He wrote it. It was an author reading. They just didn't know. 
He responded with it. He was already invested. So when the temptation came, when the trial came, when the tribulation came, he wasn't like all of a sudden looking around like, oh man, I gotta figure something out. He responded with what was already invested. He, he responded with what was already invested. It, it's the thing that I'm trying to teach my kids. I tell my kids, listen, I'm not telling you that you need to get into the word and you need to spend time in prayer uh, I, I, because, because it's a ritual or because it's a routine. I'm telling you because this is the investment for, for when you need it the most, it'll be there for you. I, I was having a conversation with my, one of my sons. I said, how much time... How, how much time are you spending? Like, what are you doing? Like, what's your thing? Like, how much time are you spending in God's word? And, and he said, oh, probably not enough. And I said, listen, it's not, a, it's not a matter of enough. There is not enough. It's not a quantity. It, it's neither, you're, you're either inviting God into that process or not. There's not a, a time limit. There's not a chapter limit. There, there's, that's, not the, that's not the case. I used to have this real, when I was growing up, a real uh, religious habit of reading the Bible. It wasn't a healthy habit of reading the Bible. It was a religious habit of reading the Bible. And if I went to bed that night and I had forgotten to read the Bible because of my religious spirit, I would wake up and I'd turn on my lamp and I'd open my Bible and I would just point to a verse and I would read it because then I could tell myself my streak is continuing. I read it. And I did that a lot. Until I got to this verse, I shouldn't share this, but I'm going to, because you're the hardcore Wednesday night people. I, one night, I was late, and I was like, oh, I didn't do it, and I flipped over my Bible, and I, like, and I literally just flipped it open, and I hit it, and I, I shared this to the pastoral stuff last week. I hit it, and I put it in there, I'm like, okay, you know, my eyes are still kind of awake, and I get it, I'm like, okay, I read it, and it's the verse, and I think it's Ezekiel, where it talks about, uh, like, this, it was talking about this wicked women and it talked about like men with the genitals of donkeys and all this kind of like really super weird stuff and all of a sudden I was like now I can't sleep <laughs> is that in the Bible? I was like what did I just read? And I was like and I laid there for like an hour and I was like God why is that in the Bible? what did I just look at? And I felt guilty because I read my Bible. I felt guilty like I just read something bad. I was like, I have no clue what this is talking about. And that was the last time I did the old flipping point because that is not a safe method. I just went to like more secure books of the Bible from then on. No prophets, no minor prophets. Just skip all that stuff. It was terrible. But it was religious. I, I was just, I was not doing it because I was investing anything. I was doing it because it was a habit. I was doing it because it was a habit. God's not a habit. He, he's a relationship. And we invest in our relationships. If you do something for your spouse out of habit, it's not gonna mean anything to them. If you set like a, a monthly calendar reminder to tell your wife you love them, like, oh, hey, my calendar just went off, wanted to tell you I love you. It's not going to have a lot of meaning to her. It, it won't check any boxes. It won't develop relationship. That's not how it works. Relationships are about intentionality. And when we invest, investing is intentional. We invest in it. And so both those styles of investments, the, the one time and the long time, we can see that in different principles in our lives, and then the daily, hold on, I may sneeze. Look at the light, what does that mean? Does it? Does it? I don't know. Okay, it's good now. You guys shamed it away. Um, both kinds of investments we'll see in our life and we, we operate in. And both of those kind of investments you can see in the concept of invitation. Both of those kind of investments you can see when it comes down to invitation. And this weekend we talked about three perspectives of invitation. The, the things that you've invited to yourself. The, th the people that you've invited. And then the invitations you've made to God. We talked about all three. And we can see these kind of relationships and, and how they work. And you know, when it comes down to the investment in you, when it comes down to the invitation that you make yourself, we, we talked about this last weekend. 
sometimes we're dealing with consequences of things that we've invited into our lives. We're dealing with the consequences of things we've invited in, of habits we've invited in, of mindsets we've invited in, of lies that we've invited in and embraced. We, we, we invite them in and then we deal with the consequences and the fruit of believing those things in our, in our lives. And, and some of the most healthy things that we can do when it comes to our personal side of invitation is uninviting some of them, telling them that they have no place, the identity and the thought and the concepts and, the, and those, those habits saying that you no longer are welcome here. And you may feel silly doing that, but there is power in your words. There is power in your invitation. There is power in the things that you invite in. But I'm just, it's tickling. It's like there, now you guys got me self-conscious. Okay, it's gone. I blame the rain. Uh, it, it's there. We have these invitations, and they're, they're in us, like, and, and we, we have them. And personal investment is great, and the things that we invite in is great. But we need to realize that there are certain things that we're going to have to invite in, and they're long-term investments, we, we invite those things into our hearts and then we know that this is something in, I invited in. This is something that I feel like God was calling me to plant in my heart and now I need to leave it alone. I need to let it grow. I need to let that identity that God spoke to me, I need to plant that inside of me and I need to let that grow. I need to let that identity grow. I don't need to be digging it up to see if it's still there. Because you, you can ruin those things that God invi invests in you and the things that you invite in. But there's certain things we need to invite in to ourselves on a daily basis. There's certain things we need to invite in on a daily basis that we need to be inviting in. We need to be inviting in God's presence. We need to be inviting in God's guidance. We need to invi be inviting in his word. We need to invite these things in on a daily basis so that we can continue to see this goodness, so that we can be ready whenever hard times come. Because, I mean, Jesus said it, that, that trials and tribulations will come. They will come. But don't worry, he's overcome the world. So, so we can understand that. But we invite these things in. And you have a limited capacity. And that's why the uninvitation is important because your portfolio can only be so big. And I guarantee you that all of us, when we look at our lives, have things that are probably loser investments that we should just get rid of and replace them with something that's more profitable long-term. That can give us a better return. That can give us more of what we're looking for in the future. But we have to be able to walk it. We have to be able to see that in our lives. We have to be able to see that in investment and, and see how that invitation comes in. You know, the second thing when it comes down to inviting others and, and your invitation to others. Man, it's such a, invitation is such a powerful thing. You know, Jesus gave, and I want to read it real quick because I want to read the whole thing. Where was it? My notes got all scrambled. Well, it's gone. Here's what it was. What it was. When Jesus said in his, his uh, one of his parables that he talked about the king who was having a banquet, and he told people to go and invite everybody, to invite everybody, and he just kept saying, nope, just keep going, just keep going, just keep going, that there's power and an invitation. There's power in compelling and inviting people so that God's house can be full. But, but you have a power not just in inviting people to church, which you do. Like the greatest way to get the seats in this place filled is not by me preaching really good or maybe stop sneezing while preaching or losing his notes or whatever it is. That's not going to be actually the thing that fills the, the seats. The greatest thing that creates growth in our church is from personal invitation from people like you. Because it, that's, that's the thing. It is invitation. It is individual invitation. And we have different ways to do that now more than ever. You can, geez Louise, you can just personally invite someone. 
You can just, you can do it on Facebook. You can do it. If there's, we have so many ways to communicate and invite people. But you have the ability to invite people. But it's not just church that you have the ability to make an invitation to. Like, you have the ability to invite someone into a relationship. Like, relationships are always done based on invitation, at least healthy ones. And the way that you can have a close relationship, an intimate relationship, a relationship that has meaning, is when you invite someone into that relationship and then you're open within that relationship. When you invite someone to a relationship and you say, like, some people that are, you're here and maybe you're lonely, Maybe you feel like no one knows you. Maybe you feel unknown. Maybe you feel like you need someone you can talk to. I can tell you this. One of the things that happens is when you invite someone into a relationship and within that you say, hey, I want to have this relationship and I want to be open and I want to be honest and I want to be transparent and I want to share struggles and I want to be able to bounce each other off, things off each other and encourage each other. When you make that invitation, the, the fear is that they'll say, no, you're weird. I don't need that. I don't want to talk to you, which may happen. It could happen. But I can tell you, if you're led by God and it's a relationship, it's not like someone you met at the grocery store, like someone you actually have a relationship with, the, there's a really good chance that what they'll respond is, man, I could really use that too. Like, I could really use someone like that too. I, I had a friend growing up that we're still friends, we're still really good friends, uh, but we grew up and it was kind of weird because, you know, when you're in high school and when you're young, we were even in junior high, like, your friends... And you talk about stuff, but when you're like in eighth grade, like nothing's really that serious really anyways, right? So like, it's like ooh, yeah, ooh, ooh, I don't know. I can't remember what was important to me. It was, nothing was that important. Like, oh, I need a new pair of Jinkos because they're so cool. Yeah, bro, Jinkos are awesome. Oh, man, I had a growth spurt. Now my Jinkos are too short. Some of you have no clue what Jinkos are. Who knows what Jinkos are? Thank you. Okay, don't make me like you guys are looking back. I don't want Jinkos. I like Jinkos, for those of you who didn't know, were the worst jeans that were ever created. They were like huge legs. Like I had a pair, they were called the K pouches, and I was a size 26 waist, but each leg hole at the bottom was 50 inches around. <laughs> so it was 100 inches circumference between the two. It was actually a Pentecostal women's skirt is what it was. <laughs> it was what I was actually wearing in hindsight. That, that I could actually spread my legs, but like that's all it was. But there was this really small time, they were so cool. They were so cool and I just had to have them. And that was important. And then we, we would talk about stuff like that. And then somehow, every time I bought a pair, I would hit like a teenage growth spurt. And the only thing that was not cool about Jinkos is if they were too short. And I would just look one day and be like, what, I have my Jinkos. But my friend was shorter than me. He's like, just give them to me, bro. He's the worst. But... You, we had these conversations, but then as we got older, and all of a sudden life got more, more like real, like we started to say older, you have real issues, and then we got married and all that stuff, we found ourselves that we realized we were at this place where we still had a friendship, but it was superficial. You know, you know what I'm saying? Like we still talked, we talked about sport, we talked about all this stuff, we talked about the same stuff we talked about in seventh grade, but we didn't talk about the stuff that we were actually going through at 20, which was not Jinko's. They're coming back, by the way. They're coming back. I saw them. I got an email because I'm on their mailing list. Uh, coming back. But all of a sudden, we had a conversation. It's like, hey, you know, can, can, we have a, can, we, can we be in a relationship where we actually talk about the things that we're going through now? Can we invite each other into that? And lo and behold, we both needed it. And we went through years where we needed the other one really bad and neither one of us were willing to make that, the, the, the invitation. Neither one of us were. And we walked through things alone when we would have had someone right there that was just an invitation away. Your invitation may not just be for you. You may not know how much that person is here on the other side of the invitation needs it, maybe more than you. You may think you need to talk to them and that once you're done, they'll be like, great, I'm glad you're done. I actually need to talk to you. I've got a lot going on. I'm not okay. And that's okay. That's okay. You, you have a powerful invitation. You have a powerful invitation. 
if, if you are, are older here tonight, you have something that not only you can invite your peers to, but you have something in your maturity and your wisdom that you can invite a younger generation to. This church needs people who have wisdom. We have young people around here who don't know anything about anything because no one's told them. We have young men who grew up without dads and they don't know how to do anything because no one told them. And they need men in their lives who can invite them even though you're like, well, they're 24 years old. They probably should know how to run a lawnmower. They don't. They don't. That you could invite them to something. You say, well, what can I teach them? I don't know. Maybe everything. <laughs> everything that you take for granted as a man that everyone knew, they probably don't know. And that's just in the natural. In the spiritual, it's the same. You get to make an invitation. And the reason I'm saying that I'm, I'm going from older than younger because the older ones are the ones who honestly you shouldn't care about being cool anymore or being like, oh, trying to like, oh, my, oh, my feelings are gonna get hurt. Like you get to make the invitation. You get to reach out. The young ones are not gonna come to you. Sorry. They still wanna be cool. But when you make an invitation, you may be surprised how quick they jump on it. Because, because you have something and they need it and you can invest it in that invitation, change something. Just because you're like, oh, well, I'm from another generation. I'm from another, that's good. They need it. They need some knowledge. They need some people who would invest into their lives and speak into their lives. And not just on how to mow a lawn or how to change the oil on a car or how to use a screwdriver and lefty loosey righty tidy. Not on the things that you said, like, but on, on other principles that you have learned throughout your life that you can reinvest through invitation to others. That's part of discipleship. That's part of what it works. That's part of multi-generational. That's why, that's why we don't have a, 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 a college age and a 30-year-old church and a 16 and 17. So like, that's why we don't do that because then generations get separated and then the older generation has no opportunity to influence the younger generation. And then we lose. We can't lose because the world is really good about passing on sinfulness from generation to generation. We need to be able to help pass on the truth of righteousness from generation to generation. And so we, we've got to do that. And then the last one, this invitation to God. You know, the Bible is full of stories where people invite God into their situation. Where they have no chance, no hope, no future, but they make an invitation and God takes them up on it. You know, the way we phrased it this last weekend is we talked about what are you asking God to help you with? Because in asking God for help, that's the invitation. That's the thing, like, God, I, I need your help. I don't have the strength. I don't have the fortitude. I don't have, I, I, I just need your help. I, I'm willing to, to, to walk it out. I'm willing to go through this process. I'm willing to make an investment, whether it's a, a one-time big investment and then wait or whether it's a daily investment and then finally be prepared at a certain time. I, I, we're willing, to, but I need you. I need you. And asking for help is easier for some than others. But we, when we invite God into things, it makes a difference. And when we also lay down the fact that there, we think that there's certain things we should do for ourselves because we think God's uninterested or because we'd be bothering God, or because it's too little for God. So we don't, we don't reach out because we should do it ourselves. We should do it ourselves. And there's this invitation that comes that God is waiting for. And there's so many things in my life, and I'm sure in your life, that God was just on the sidelines there, willing, able, 
and just be like, all you got to do is just, just ask me. Like, I'm here. Love to help. Love to step in. Love to give you the answer. But, but you got to ask. You got to ask. I hear that all the time. I talk to students all the time, and I ask them about school, and they say, oh, yeah, this is, I always ask, what's your least favorite class? I always ask, what's your least favorite class? And it's almost always math for some reason, which hurts my feelings. But math, and then, like, and then history, and I'm like, why won't you just stab me? Uh, <laughs> so my two favorites. Next you're going to say P.E. But, but they're like, I don't get math. Because I don't understand it. I don't understand how this works. I don't understand that law works. So I say, okay, do you ever ask your teacher, do you ever raise your hand and say, teacher, I don't understand. Can you show that to me again? I'm like, no. Why would I do that? People would make fun of me. Why? Because I don't know the answer. So, so you're worried about what other people think, but you don't know the answer, and you won't ask the person who has the answer, so you just go on not knowing the answer because you're afraid to ask the person who has the answer. Yeah. So you'd rather get bad grades, be stressed out, fail, end up working a minimum wage job for the rest of your life because you just don't want to raise your hand and ask. Yeah. And you know none of your other friends understand either. Yeah. We all don't understand. But none of us are willing to raise our hands and ask. I had one who said, I won't ask in class, but I go at lunchtime and meet with my math teacher so they can teach me then when the class is not there. We've developed a culture where asking for help is not okay, and unfortunately, we've projected that onto our relationship with God, where we think that if we're like, God, can you help me? He's just going to ridicule you and make fun of you and then send you to the dunce corner. That's not what he does. Like, there's no story in the Bible where someone cries out to God for help and he's like, I'm busy. Or, you're not that important. Or, you should have done better yourself. Like, that doesn't happen. In fact, Jesus and his life and his ministry, and when Jesus says, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father... I'm so you can know how the Father's heart is. In Jesus' ministry, he kept on having all these missions and these things that he had to do, and he kept getting distracted by the number of people who would ask him for help. That's why in Mark, one of the biggest things that said, it says that he was moved with compassion. He wasn't there to heal people. He wasn't there to do miracles. He wasn't there to feed them. He wasn't there to do all that stuff. He had other things he was supposed to be doing, which was sharing about the good news and this new thing that was happening. And yet, these people kept crying out and inviting him to help. And it was like Jesus was incapable to turn him down. And sometimes he tried to do it in private, and sometimes he tell them, them, don't tell anybody, or like, oh, hey, a, let me spit in your eye. Like, he, he would do all these different things, but he couldn't stop himself. Like, he couldn't stop himself. And do you not understand, that's the picture of who God is to you. That when you cry out, son of David, please have mercy on me, and all of his disciples are like, shut up, guy, you're just a waste of space. Jesus is like, no, 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 no. That's not who I am. I'm going to go heal that guy. Stop stopping the children to get to me. I, this is the kingdom. This is who it is. I'm going to get, they're going to come to me. Like the only people who got reprimanded when people asked help, help were his disciples. Not the people who asked for help. It was the people who tried to tell them, no, 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 you're not good enough. You're not important enough or he's too busy for you. Those were the people who got reprimanded. The ones who asked for help received what they asked for. Those who came to him got it. And it, not only did they get it, there are so many stories, whether it was the woman with the issue of blood or the leper or, or the ten lepers or how, I mean, there's so many different people who the truth was, by the law and the society that they're living for, they should have been punished, some of them by death, for even coming and asking. Not only did he not punish them, he actually gave them what they were asking for. 
How much more so then by us who are bought and purchased and redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus, how much more so do we have access to the Father that now we can boldly go into the throne room of grace and invite our Father to help us and see what he does and see the investment he makes in us. And you know what? He may make an investment that's a one-time investment and you may have to wait a while before you see the harvest of that seed that was sown. But I promise there'll be a harvest. Or maybe he'll make an investment that's daily, incremental improvement and growth so that one day when you're faced with the same thing, you're ready. But I can tell you, whichever investment it is, when we invite God into the process, he's gonna show up. He's gonna say yes. He's just waiting. He's the father that even when the prodigal son is still far away, he embarrasses himself and runs to go and find him. And he saw him far away because he was daily looking for him, waiting for him to come back. So even if you feel like, well, I'm far away from God, you're not. You're not. He's there waiting for the invitation, waiting for you to come back and invite him to help. And the investment will pay dividends and the investment will have a harvest. And and I can't tell you what it'll look like. I can't tell you when it'll happen. I can't tell you if you're gonna have to go through this strenuous process of time or if it's gonna be a daily test of your, of your continued discipline. I, I can't tell you what it's gonna look like, but I can tell you he's faithful to complete what he starts inside of you. So this month, I hope you take some time and you invite some things in and you invite some things out of yourself. You take some time, you ask God to help search yourself and figure out what needs to be there and what doesn't. I hope you look at somebody and you make an invitation to a person. Maybe to church, maybe to lunch, maybe to a relationship, maybe to grab coffee. I hope you make an invitation to someone. And and most importantly, I hope you look and you turn to God and you invite God to help him in things in your life that need some help. To situations and scenarios that need a touch from him. And listen and hear and see where where he shows up. Father God, thank you for tonight. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you that we can come boldly to your throne, Father God. Lord, thank you that we can invite you into our process. Lord, thank you that you love us. Lord, thank you that I believe you're going to speak to our hearts about what's inside of us that we need to invite out or invite in or what we need to move in in our own hearts, Father God. Lord, I thank you that you're going to speak to our minds and you're going to tell us who we can invite to a process or to a journey or to a relationship or whatever it may be. And Lord, I pray that you would even, with the goodness and the kindness that leads us to repentance, that you would speak to our hearts on how we can invite you into our process, how we can ask you for help, that you can give us the courage to know that you're there working, Father. We love you. We praise you. It's in your holy name we pray. Amen and amen.